Hello and welcome back to our series of videos on the Scottish Wars of Independence. This session is going to be on Scotland's Civil War, focusing on the actions of Bruce in the winter of 1307 into 1308. This section is going to learn how Bruce took the war to his Scottish enemies and by the end of this session we should be able to describe how Bruce campaigned against his enemies in Scotland and be able to explain why Bruce turned on his Scottish enemies in the winter. 1307 to 1308, which is an unusual time for an army to have been campaigning in the medieval period. As usual with our sessions, uh, this is to build up your notes for the Scottish Wars of Independence course. So if the information appears in bold, please take a note down. The information that's not in bold is this contextual information to build up a, a deeper picture of what's going on at the time. So to begin. After his campaigns in Ayrshire, in 1307 where Bruce made a successful return uh, to the shores of mainland Scotland after his horrific beating at the hands of the English and his Scottish enemies in 1306. Bruce lucked out if we recall from the last session. He managed to beat Aymer de Valance at the Battle of Loudon Hill even though outnumbered and other English armies that were cutting about in Ayrshire at the time were also defeated by the Bruce giving him a bit of a free hand to go off and follow his own pursuits. Now, the English had come to deal with Bruce en masse, Edward I leading his uh, army up to the border with Scotland, but Edward was an old man by 1307 and died at the age of 68 at Borough on Sands, just south of the Scottish border. His son, now Edward II, chose to deal with Edward's body and take it to Richmond uh, to begin the proper process of his burial, rather than immediately pursuing Bruce in dealing with the issue of this Scottish rebel against the English control of Scotland. This gave Bruce a free hand uh, to pursue his own aims, and rather than wait around for Edward to come and face him with a much stronger army, Bruce immediately set to work and went north to deal with his common family enemies. So whilst Prince Edward of Carnarvon then is marching the main English army to Richmond with his father's body, we see uh, with the armies of Aymer de Valance and the Earl of Gloucester defeated in Ayrshire, Bruce finds himself with unexpected breathing space towards the end of 1307's campaigning season. Bruce acts quickly on the assumption that English were bound to return in strength for the campaigning season of 1308. So this would explain why Bruce was active during the winter months when armies usually disband and the soldiers would go home. So leaving behind key supporters such as James the Black Douglas, one of the stars of the Netflix movie Outlaw King, to continue Bruce's rebellion in the south, doing his work down in his own homelands and the borders. In the summer of 1307, Bruce marched north to deal with his main enemies in Scotland, the Common Family. Now, one of the first um, obstacles that Bruce encounters is near modern-day Fort William at Inverlochy. And this castle here uh, is a stronghold of the common family at the southwestern end of the Great Glen. This is going to control access to Loch Ness, which offers a main thoroughfare up through the Highlands to Inverness and the heartlands of the commons in Moray, just beyond. So Bruce had decided to settle his dispute with the common family once and for all, and only then, once they are out of the way and dealt with, pacified, could the kingdom stand united against England. The commons, after Bruce's murder of their main man, John the Red Common, in Greyfriars Kirk and Dumfries in February 1306, were never, ever going to fall in line and stand with Bruce against the English. Bruce had to deal with this family. He had to remove it. And to do that, he was going to have to take an army against them. All the while, while the shadow of English um, attack is hovering over him. In the centre of Common Power lay in the northeast of Scotland, and it was here that Bruce was headed. The northeast of Scotland, Moray, had historically been a thorn in the side of the kings of Scotland for centuries by the time we get to Bruce. Way back when the Kingdom of Alba was first formed and becomes Scotland around about the year 900. Um, at that time, the major dynasties of Scotland, the two major kind of royal family branches, were based in uh, near Schoon in Perth, 
and the other branch of the royal family were based in Moray, where the commons are. Now, they used to share the crown between them, going way back into the, the early medieval period. And one member of the Moray family would have a turn at being the king, and then it would swap across to the cousins, and the, the kings down further south would have a turn at being king. And it was supposed to be that it was swapped between them. Now, in the 10th century, this process stopped, and it was the, the family line based in Moray that lost out. Now, over the centuries, the reigning end of the family dealt with this by periodically crushing their upstart cousins. But Moray offers a wide, wide expanse of good agricultural land. It is a good earner. It has lots and lots of uh, population at this time as well, so it's a good base for raising armies. It is going to be a, a bastion for any ambitious family to build a power base and make their own bid for the crown, which is what they did over the centuries, whether they're cousins of the main royal family or not. So by the time we get to the Bruce, we find the commons are in charge of this part of Scotland, and because of the riches that part of the land affords them, they are main contenders for the throne. This is why Bruce needs to go there and deal with this problem. His first major target on his route north was the common castle of Inverlochy, shown here in Loch Aber. This is just outside of modern day Fort William. You can go and visit it. It's next to a gigantic aluminium factory. Now, after he took Inverlochy Castle, um, Bruce travelled north up the Great Glen, capturing Urquhart's Castle and Inverness Castle of Ease. Now, Urquhart Castle is the one that you famously see in a lot of the Visit Scotland tourist images. It's the ruined castle that overlooks Loch Ness. It's the one where famously Nessie was allegedly photographed from as well. Uh, but it's quite a significant stronghold. So having taken Inverlochy first at the bottom end of the Great Glen and fairly ruined it, it wasn't occupied for at least 50 years after Bruce went through there. Uh, Bruce makes his way north up Loch Ness, taking Urquhart and then Inverness right at the top of the Great Glen. Now he didn't do that completely unopposed. Um, as you can see in the scroll in the top left, the English rolled out their Scottish allies, their liegemen in Scotland, to basically come against Bruce to stop the rise of this rebel against the, the established English control. And the Earl of Ross, whose lands were just north of um, the Great Glen in Loch Ness, um, he did his job. So he rolled out and he brought his forces with him. And this is a letter that still survives that he wrote to Edward II in the aftermath of that. And it says... Be it known that we heard of the coming of Sir Robert Bruce towards Ross with great force, so that we had no power against them. But nevertheless, we caused our men to be called out, and we were stationed for a fortnight with 3,000 men at our own expense on the borders of our earldom. And Bruce would have destroyed them utterly if we had made no truce with them. So this is the Earl of Ross basically trying to cover his own backside for giving in to the Bruce and not even fighting. He saw Bruce's army coming and he melted away, legged it, and then safely later came to terms with Bruce to say, I'm not going to fight you, I'm going to come across to your side. He sent that letter to make sure that Edward II didn't come back to Scotland later on if there was a change in events and hang him. Now when Bruce is coming up, the Great Glen, uh, we think he had an army of around about 3,000 men. And these would have been men coming off the successes of the summer campaign of 1307, having defeated the English at Loudon Hill. I've gathered lots of supporters on the way as they went through the kingdom, working their way north. So they have the momentum with them. And to some extent, there's a core of that army that are going to be disciplined and experienced veterans. The Earl of Ross probably does not have that in his force. And he knows that Bruce would have simply rolled across him. So he has played the most sensible option here by giving this one a miss. So Bruce is able to make his way through the Great Glen, mostly unopposed after he takes Inverlochy Castle at the south end of it. And he gets into these common heartlands just east of Inverness. So the war against the commons can then begin with Gusto. The Bishop of Moray, David Murray, sent the Bruce a letter as Bruce approaches, promising the people of Moray would rise up and he would support him with an army of 3,000 men. It is not known if they honoured their offer. We have no records of that. But... King Robert travelled to Moray next, having emerged from Inverness, 
and he spent the winter of 1307 to 1308 harrying English garrisons and common castles. So basically this is like a, a campaign of hit and run attacks, of making a nuisance of himself, of denying the garrisons in these castles access to the lands to take in supplies. He's basically making life miserable for the enemy forces in the region. Now this is unusual for medieval armies to be campaigning at this time. It costs a lot of money for a medieval army to be in the field, to be actively campaigning. Um, the nobles have to pay to keep the men there, and it is not an expense they um, look forward to paying. Oh, also, during the winter time, in the Scottish weather certainly, uh, the roads just turned to mush. This is the time before tarmac to pave roads, so we're talking about dirt tracks, so it's difficult to get around. There is not food easily available, just growing in the fields or growing on trees. So there's no fruit, vegetables that you can easily get. You have to use stockpile re reserves and they need to be paid for or captured from the enemy. And if the enemy are savvy, like the commons in English would have been, they'll have taken that harvested food and they'll be hiding it behind their castle walls where Bruce cannot get to it. So it's difficult to keep a gathering of literally thousands of men well fed, well supplied, and on the go all the way through winter. So this is why winter campaigns are quite rare. So what Bruce is up to here is unusual. The English and the Commons would not have expected it, and to some extent, it would have put them on the back foot. So Bruce does take some successes from this campaign. He manages to capture Neon Castle, and he destroys it. This is one of the strongholds of the English up in the air. But that's kind of where it stops for Bruce at that time. Poor Bruce, would have been super, super cold. Now, without siege equipment and engineers, taking enemy castles is never going to have been easy. He doesn't have catapults to smash down the walls. He doesn't have engineers to set to dig in mines and tunnels to undermine the walls of a castle and cause them to collapse. He doesn't have battering rams to smash down castle gates. He has not got the equipment to get into these English-held castles. Now, a garrison might be as few as 30 men to hold the walls of a castle against an army that could number hundreds or even a few thousands. But that's all you need. If the army outside doesn't have the equipment to get across those walls, then the men on those walls can shoot the attackers to bits with crossbows and dropping things from the battlements down on them as they try and attack and approach. It is a deadly, deadly effort to try and get into a castle without the proper equipment. And Bruce didn't have it. So taking Nairn Castle early on in this campaign up here was probably quite a notable success. So Bruce tried twice to take Elgin Castle, another English-held one, uh, from its garrison, but failed. And the war continued through the winter of 1307, and the fighting was relentless. Exhausted by his efforts, Bruce falls ill whilst attacking Banff. The sensing their chance to turn the tide and to eliminate Bruce, the remaining common forces under John, the Earl of Buchan. Now, the common family, like it seems all medieval noble families in Scotland, have a massive lack of creativity when it comes to names. Um, so whereas we're coming across names like Edward an awful lot, in the common family, loads of them seem to be called John. So this John, Earl of Common, is not the one that uh, Robert the Bruce stabbed in February 1306. This is a relation, also called John. So, the remaining common forces under John the Earl of Buchan corner Bruce's army in a boggy forest at Sleoch, near Huntley in Aberdeenshire. Now, this would have been a pretty, pretty grim situation for Bruce's men. The king is sick, the weather's appalling, the men are starving, they're wet, they're uncomfortable, and they're surrounded by enemy forces and stuck in a boggy wood. So the Bruce's army are dismayed by the king's illness and rumour spreads that he is dying. This isn't a cold or a sniffle that Bruce has got. He is seriously, seriously ill and he doesn't show any signs of getting better. As the army had been moving around and campaigning across Moray and Aberdeenshire, Bruce had gotten to the stage that he couldn't ride a horse anymore. He had to be carried about on a litter, obviously, a stretcher by his men. And that's never uh, going to set a good example to his men. Bruce seemed finished, with his weary army trapped in a lonely, boggy wood. Now he'd come up the Great Glen with an army of around about 3,000 men. We think that uh, by the time we get to Sleok Woods, 
and his men have become dispirited by the way the campaign's going and by the illness of their king. His army is depleted down to about 700 men through desertions and losses. Luck, however, was finally going to play a part for Bruce. It was Christmas Day in 1307, and because it was a holy day, Common refused to push on with his attack. He gave Bruce's army breathing space, which is a fatal mistake. Instead, Robert's younger brother, Edward Bruce, took over command of the army from his sick brother, and he led a counterattack. Bruce's army issued out from the forest on Christmas Day, and after a small skirmish, the Coleman army fell back. They weren't willing to fight on Christmas. So it was a key mistake by Coleman. He fell back and regrouped, not returning until the 1st of January 1308. By this time, however, Bruce's army had recovered enough to make a fighting withdrawal to the safety of Huntley. So they got their act together, he got out of that forest, and they managed to fend off the common forces and withdraw to their own safer stronghold. Discouraged by the Bruce's recovery, Common withdrew once again. So Common has blown his big chance to basically crush the Bruce army. Slowly recovering, King Robert resumes his attacks. His forces capture Balvenie Castle, and then this one shown here, uh, Duffus Castle, the headquarters of Edward II's chief lieutenant in the northeast of Scotland, Sir Reginald Chain. Now it's important to remember, still at this stage, the Kingdom of Scotland is largely under the control of the English. Um, Edward I had spent the years between his victory at the Battle of Falkirk and basically the final submission of the Scottish nobles in 1304, he'd spent that time taking control of the Kingdom of Scotland, wearing down its fighters and its resources, winning the Scottish nobles over to his side. And by the time we get to Bruce merging Common and Greyfriars Kirk, a lot of Scotland is in English hands. A lot of nobles have a vested interest in maintaining English control. And um, in North East of Scotland, that is uh, the case here as well. A lot of these castles are English held. And this man, Reginald Chain, is the chief English lord in this area. So Bruce isn't only just fighting against the commons when he's up in Moray, he's also fighting against the English presence, an armed English presence too. Now, part of the... The reason why Bruce was able to be successful here is because it seems the commons do not work well together with the English. So Bruce is, in a way, able to divide and conquer. The commons don't come to rescue English-held castles being besieged by Bruce. And likewise, when Bruce goes up against the common, the English are not rolling out from their castles to come and attack Bruce's armies in the rear. So Bruce is able to get away with attacking his enemies one at a time. So Chain's efforts to confront Bruce seem half-hearted. The English garrisons in the commons seemed unable to properly coordinate their efforts against the Bruce. Now this castle, Duffus, is quite an interesting one to visit. As you can see by the pictures here, there's some, some crazy stuff going on with the castle. Now in England, if you go and visit a lot of the castles down there, they look like this. Now the reason they look like this is because in the English Civil War, right at the end of the useful period of castles, uh, when cannons and gunpowder were on the go, um, the parliamentary army blew up and slighted a lot of English castles, literally packed them with gunpowder and blew them to bits to stop them being used by royalist forces against parliament. And that's why many English castles look like this. That did not happen to Duffus. This damage we can see here is the result of subsistence. They built a gigantic stone castle on an earthen mound that was man-made and it did not have the proper foundations it required. In the 17th century, apparently, it just collapsed in on itself, which must have been horrifying for the owners. It was occupied until 1705, and then they just gave up on it. You can see that is quite the lean. An amazing place to go and visit. Now, Bruce and Commons armies met again on the 23rd of May, 1308, on the road between Old Meldrum and Inverurie. Bruce is still weak. He's been carried from place to place by supporters still on that stretcher. And on the night of the 22nd, Bruce's army camped in Inverurie itself. Now before we carry on, just take that on board. Bruce has been so sick for now more than six months that he still requires to move around on the stretcher. This is a serious illness that the king has. And it's no wonder that his men had basically lost faith in, in the campaign 
and then their leader. We don't know exactly what it was that went wrong with Bruce. At this stage, he is in his mid-30s, so he should be at the, the height of his powers physically. And we do know that Bruce died in his mid-50s um, from leprosy. So this may have been the disease first taken hold on his system. It could have been that. Um, they don't give us any other description of what was wrong with the king. And I suppose if Bruce is going to have a long reign as eventually a successful king of Scotland, his biographers are not going to write about all the things that are wrong with him. That's not what you want to have in your official account. So I guess it's no wonder that we don't know exactly what was wrong with the man. However, when this battle breaks out, he is flat on his back and being carted around on a stretcher. So at dawn, on the 23rd of May, David, the Lord of Brecon, made a surprise attack. Now, he may have been the Lord of Brecon, but David is fighting on the, the common side and basically aligned with English. He made a surprise attack on Bruce's camp. His men galloped over the bridge um, on the River Uri at Balgardi, right into the streets of Inverurie, and right into the heart of Bruce's army, who are basically snoozing. Taken completely unprepared, Bruce's sentries were quickly cut down, and those who survived legged it, and they took refuge in the nearby castle. However, it seems that David, the Lord of Brecon, was a little bit fiery and a wee bit too keen for the rest of his army. Commons' main force was still too far away to take advantage of this opportunity. So they caught Bruce's army with their britches down, but the Commons were unable to capitalise and David, the Lord of Brecon, had to fall back lest he himself be caught and captured. Now this picture here shows you uh, an idea of the battlefield. So this is land near Inverurie. Um, we're talking about Aberdeenshire and Timori. This gives you an example or an idea of why this part of the country is just so valuable. Now compare this to what we have here in Argyll. This is farmland that is going as far as the eye can see. This is going to feed your people. It's also going to produce an excess that you can sell and make lots of money from. This is a viable, valuable area of the kingdom. And you can see how this creates a power base for the commons. And this is why Bruce has to go and deal with them. Now Bruce, who's still ill, rose from his bed and prepared a counterattack. He ordered his men to strap him onto a horse for the fight to the inspiration and cheers of his men. Now they had to lash him to that horse. Bruce did not have the physical strength to sit upright long enough to uh, ride that horse and control this battle. He has to be held in place. But he knows the symbolic value of that. The king has risen from his sickbed. The king is going to be all right. So it rouses his men. You can imagine their cheers rolling across the battlefield. Now as he approaches the Bruce's position, Common hastily drew up his forces across the road to Inverurie between a place called Barra Hill and the marshes of the Loch Burn. His unreliable peasant feudal levies were placed at the rear of his army with the knights and the men-at-arms taking up a position to the front. Now this is a standard uh, deployment for a medieval force. Medieval armies are made up of the lords who bring their professional retinues or soldiers who would basically garrison their castles for them, gather in taxes for them and so on. Those men are the professional fighters, the one with the best equipment, the one who do this for a living, the ones who know how to fight. The lords would also, for the benefit of numbers to swell the size of the force, bring their peasant levy. So part of the role on the duty of peasants who live on a noble's land is the obligation is that when the noble calls them out, their boss calls them out to come and do their service, they have to take whatever weapons and armour they have, which is possibly sometimes literally a pitchfork, um, and come and serve in the Lord's army for weeks at a time. So these peasants are basically there as a mob for numbers to build up uh, the professional soldiers at the front. So we've got the ones who can actually fight in the front of the force, they're the one who do the bulk of the fighting. The idea is that the peasants are there for show and to do the pushing uh, at the back. So this is what Common's army is. And Bruce's army, to some extent, would have probably been similar. Although there would have been, I imagine, more professional soldiers in his force. Common's levies, so these peasants, seem to have been given the assurance that Bruce was too ill to take to the field in person. I suppose you wouldn't want to go to actually fight in a battle against the army of the king of the, the land. That would be quite a scary thing. 
Um, so imagine if your Lord is telling you, ah, don't worry, lads, he's too sick, he's done his deathbed, he's not going to last, this is going to be a nice, easy fight, nothing to worry about. And then you get there and you see the king on the other side of the battlefield on his horse and his army pumped for the fight, you're probably going to have second thoughts. And that appears to be what happens to Colin's army. So as it says, Colin's army seemed to have been given the assurance that Bruce was too ill to take the field in person. His appearance creates a shock amongst the common army's ranks. Common's peasants began to drop their weapons and to flee. They saw the king and they bottled it. Common made some attempt to steady his line, but as his army began to collapse around him, he too soon joins the fight. Now, professional soldiers are not going to stick around and get killed in a fight that they see they cannot win. Those peasant soldiers who are behind them are important because they need them for weight of numbers. You need loads of people to push in from behind. It's like a rugby scrum in a fight. If they're not there, the other new, more numerous enemy army, even if you're really good soldiers, they're just going to come across that field and roll over you through weight of numbers. So Commons professional soldiers would have seen the peasants go and they'd have probably followed right after them as well. So it made sense that Common had to leg it too, otherwise he would have been taken or killed in the fight. So Common joins the flight, pursued by Bruce's men on horseback as far as Fivey in Aberdeenshire. The fugitive Earl fled all the way to England, where he died later that same year. Now, on the edge, I believe, of old Meldrum High School is this stone here, the Bruce's seat. It is a conveniently shaped lump of rock where local legend in old Meldrum has it that Bruce sat and watched the battle unfold, which does slightly go against their account of the fact that they wedged them onto a horse. But there you go, local tradition. Now, the Battle of Inverurie ended active military resistance to King Robert in Aberdeenshire and in North East Scotland, and it opened the door for Robert to take his revenge. At this point, he is in charge of all of the common heartlands. He has killed the main man of the common family in Greyfriars Kirk in 1306. He has taken control of the Great Glen, where Loch Ness is, and access to common lands, decimated their castle. He has defeated their army in battle in the common heartland, and now he has sent the well, the substantive common lord basically into exile from his own lands, and he controls the ancestral common homelands. Everything is now in his hands. He has destroyed his main enemy within Scotland. So today's big question builds on that. Bruce is coming back, it seems, from his serious illness. He has contained the English garrisons in the northeast of Scotland, and now he has destroyed his key Scottish enemy. So your question in today's session is, in the spring of 1308, with Common having fled the country, in northeast Scotland in his hands, what steps could Bruce now take to ensure the loyalty of the northern end of his kingdom? If you remember in 1306, Bruce had to campaign from Fife up towards Aberdeen, and he had to go through all those Scottish laws one by one and threaten them with hanging unless they came over to his side. And as soon as he had his troubles and was sent packing off to the west, those lords would have fallen back in with the English. So how does he stop something like that happening again if the English come back? What can Bruce do to make sure that the North East of Scotland stays in his hands and stays loyal to him? That's my question to you. Um, I'd like you to form your answers before we come together for our next session. So that's it for today. Um, thanks very much for listening. See you next time.